Hello, I'm Edward Kirkmonico. And I'm Kathleen Tanel Handel. And together we're sharing our two part presentation, No Traces to Save, about an often overlooked topic the history and continued significance of mobile home communities. Research for my 2014 preservation thesis focused on a single community whose residents incorporated themselves to save their homes from destruction. I've since realized just how much work there is to be done in order to bring these communities to the forefront of preservation practice. There are big questions about why historians, design professionals, and many others have actively ignored mobile home parks. Communities that are alive with the richness of variations at every scale. To see these places is not just to catalog their structures, but to bear witness to their humanity. But first, we have to know what we're looking at. That is why I'm glad to be collaborating with Kathleen again. Throughout our presentation, her photographs and upcoming comments speak about the importance of advocacy and help us see what has been overlooked and is now being lost. For the past century, there has been a mix of prejudice and uncertainty, ignorance and intolerance towards the communities and the people they house. At best count, mobile homes are home to between 18 to 20 million people, around one in every 16 Americans, equivalent to half the population of Canada. What is often seen as life on the fringe is actually at the very center of what and where it means to be an American. Today, there are approximately 40,000 parks of various sizes across the country. They predate the motel, enabled post-World War I migration, filled housing shortages during and after World War II, and came into their own as the housing for millions from the 1950s onwards. Since the following decade, the 1960s, about 10% of housing starts has been mobile or more recently manufactured homes. Often hidden in plain sight, this predominantly American housing form is where people live, where children grow up and where adults grow old. It is also where the vulnerable find shelter and community. Still, for all they have done, they are largely ignored. There are currently no mobile homes or mobile home parks in the National Register of Historic Places. This should change. It may be an excuse that they are not studied because they are hidden, but it is also our fault as historians for not looking. In ignoring the typology, historians, preservation professionals, city leaders, and many others, has made it easier for them to disappear. Especially in urban areas where rents are skyrocketing and development pressures overwhelm, historic mobile home communities are becoming scarcer every year. Seeing such places as historic in their own right is both a preservation and equity issue. Referred to by the initialism MHC, mobile home communities leave no traces there is nothing to come back to. What is gone when they are destroyed is the last corner of affordable housing, a hyper adaptive form that has been maligned for serving those in need. In his seminal essay, The Westward Moving House, the geographer J.B. Jackson connects the trailer to earlier vernacular structures like the log cabin. He lays the framework for understanding their antecedents as chattel, a home untethered to land in the feudal tradition. The comparison with the log cabin is apt in the functional sense, though there is a monumental gap in perception. While one has become a representation of an idealized foundational belief in overcoming adversity through hard work and perseverance, the other is a reminder of fragility and impermanent. The MHC is an antithesis to the zeitgeist of eventual prosperity. Without the perceived innocence of the frontier, hardship, it seems, has lost its luster. Pockets of mobile homes are seen as aberrations in the contemporary landscape, a tragic reminder of vulnerability. 
The bias towards what belongs is deep and pervasive and began early on. During the Great Depression, large scale financial distress and a lack of low cost housing options created the conditions for a growing population of permanent trailer residents. In cities, tightly packed trailers on, our, on abandoned lots became housing of last resort for the urban poor. It was during this time that the negative attitude towards residents developed, an attitude that became so pervasive that it remains in one form or another to this day. Their ability to be rapidly deployed, however, proved especially essential in the following decade. The importance of trailers during World War II cannot be overstated. A temporary top-down legitimization and the concomitant ramp up of private development resulted in housing about one in eight war workers near new production facilities on the West Coast, as one study found. By 1948, approximately 7% of the US population lived in a trailer. While the overall effect is difficult to estimate, the ability to quickly house war workers meant that the United States ramped up manufacturing far faster than would otherwise have been possible. Many factories were built by roving bands of workers who took their trailers with them, with trailers again popping up nearby once production began on a nationwide as needed and where needed basis. In this way, the trailer is one of the unsung heroes of the home front. In the post-war years, the federal government embarked on major undertakings, including the construction of the interstate highway system. At the same time, many municipalities commenced utility and infrastructural upgrades. With the beginnings of suburban sprawl, power, sewer, water, and roads were stretched even further afield as the facilities they relied on were expanded to meet growing demand. Between 1950 and 1954, about two thirds of trailer homes were purchased by or for itinerant workers and their families. Moving from one project to the next, these workers were part of crews whose skilled hand is still visible all across America. As the pace of suburban growth started to catch up with demand, the housing shortage moved down the economic ladder. The middle class no longer needed to put up with temporary solutions and the mobile home park increasingly became a space of the underemployed and the vulnerable. In this way, MHCs can be seen as part of the lineage of tenement housing, taking the mantle as many tenements were destroyed through urban renewal. As sociologist Esther Sullivan notes, that this role was reinforced beginning in the 1960s with the federal government's gradual defunding of affordable housing subsidies. Often, MHC residents have nowhere else to go and not by choice. Planning authorities discriminate against further park development through restrictive zoning laws that relegated and continue to relegate parks to peripheral or non-desirable areas, if they are allowed at all. Their banishment to concealed sites on the urban fringe and beyond, where many were originally built on unincorporated land and grandfathered in after township expansions, continues false negative stereotypes about residents. To put it plainly, this is housing discrimination at its most obvious, out in the open. But it is so blatant and legally codified that it is not seen as such. Part of the confusion may be in the name. Originally termed trailers for their attachment to the vehicle, they were later transformed into much larger units and rebranded as mobile homes. The vast majority, however, do not move once they are sighted, nor do their residents. The average period of ownership is some 10 years, not that far off from site-built homes. Even with a shift in terminology to manufactured housing, undignified prejudices continue to stick, including, and perhaps especially, in the preservation field. With that, I'm honored to pass it over to Kathleen. These striking images that we've been seeing form her ongoing research-based project, 
I also reveal and remind us that these are colorful, strong, yet all too often quickly disappearing communities. Thank you so much, Edward. That was really thought provoking. Edward's comments contain points from his 2014 graduate thesis that are part of what drew me to reach out to him in 2018. We immediately decided to begin collaborating over our shared concern about the stereotyping and vulnerability of mobile home communities and their residents. My ongoing project titled, Where the Heart Is, Portraits from Vernacular American Trailer and Mobile Home Parks, began in Colorado in 2017 when I walked into a mobile home community for the first time. I was captivated by the vernacular architecture and by the way many people's choices in landscaping and ornamentation helped create a sense of home and community and express their personalities. Children were out riding their bikes and playing together and neighbors were visiting on front stoops, reminding me of the tight knit community I'd grown up in rather than of the media induced stereotype of mobile home parks that I'd been imprinted with. Pre-COVID, as I photographed in trailer parks and mobile home and manufactured housing communities around the United States, homeowners frequently came outside, initially wanting to know why I was pointing my camera at their front doors, but then often engaging me in conversations that regularly included their confiding stories and concerns to me. Hearing them compelled me to begin researching in areas such as the socioeconomics, demographics, and history of mobile homes, their communities, and their residents. Subsequent collaboration with scholars, professionals like Edward, and housing advocates all working under the same affordable housing umbrella has also enabled me to more deeply understand the nuances of what I visually respond to. This predominantly American housing form was a critical component of post -World War II, the post-World War II housing boom and a tangible reminder of our earlier design and manufacturing strengths. Mobile and manufactured housing is our largest form of non-subsidized low-income housing for 2 million Americans in 1956 and to an estimated 20 million today. These essential workers, students, and working poor with limited finances immigrant and young families starting out, veterans and retirees on fixed incomes, all gained a toehold on their version of the American dream, thanks to joining a community and owning their own home with a yard to enjoy, even if typically sited on land leased from the park's owner. In my travel, the unique ways that people individualize a standardly configured mobile home and yard to express themselves creatively often despite limited means, never ceases to delight and engage me. As a park owner in Georgia exclaimed when I described what I was asking permission to photograph, his, oh, you mean the yard art, became the perfect moniker for this form of self-expression and outsider art that encapsulates the universal human need to create and to make a place that looks and feels like home. New Jersey is my favorite of the nine states I've photographed in so far. Maine, New York, Georgia, Texas, Arizona, California, Oregon, and Colorado being the other eight. The unbridled enthusiasm for whimsical, religious, and political yard art and window art is unparalleled in my travels. I find it so intriguing that people in MHCs live in a density similar to that of my apartment building in New York City, with neighbors also able to hear your every sneeze but that they still choose to also publicly share so much of themselves around their home's exterior for all to see. Besides the Sun Belt states I've photographed in, New Jersey is where I've seen the largest number of communities filled with fabulous vintage 1950s trailers and 1960s and 70s mobile homes just crying out for heritage recognition. Zoning often requires perimeter fencing or landscaping, apparently so to visually buffer the delicate sensibilities of regular folk from the site of an MHC on the outskirts of town. With the right mix of neighbors and management, the ensuing isolation has traditionally helped foster a strong sense of community inside mobile home parks. But being on the edge has also been shown to create vulnerability to our increasingly volatile weather. 
many New Jersey communities' response to the extensive flooding from 2012's strongest hurricane, Hurricane Sandy, has been to precariously site homes atop a loose stack of cinder blocks leveled by wood shims and without anchoring from strong winds. Such lax building codes often don't protect even new MHC housing, in contrast to the strong zoning that prohibits them. To date, I spent the most time photographing in California. Here, the early acceptance of mobile home communities by Hollywood stars, enhanced by regions with the type of climate often favored by retirees, has helped lead to California being the state having the second highest number of MHCs in the US, slightly behind Florida. From iconic palm trees and mini Zen gardens along the coast, to over roofs sheltering from blazing sun or lot line fencing protecting from sandstorms in the Coachella Valley, the impact that California's regional environmental differences have on homes, exterior structures and landscapes is clear. While the dry climate in large areas of California has protected many trailers and mobile homes from rust deterioration, they remain vulnerable to rampant gentrification that has reached the former outskirts. This increases the value of the land long-term mom and pop owners lease for the residents' lots, encouraging them to sell to large corporations and contributing to residents' displacement. While out photographing one day, I was approached by a coastal community manager and asked what I was doing. After explaining my project, she told me that the owner was requiring that all older trailers be removed and replaced with new, larger manufactured homes that he could charge increased lot fees for. She directed me to photograph specific trailers before they were gone. So they're now preserved only as photographs. I wonder how many others have no record of their existence in any public archive. My project began in Colorado, and that's where I last photographed before COVID put my travels on hiatus. I went to Aurora to photograph Denver Meadows, where I'd been told the residents were fighting eviction by the owner. Since mobile homes aren't really mobile, and residents fall between the cracks as both homeowners and renters, their protections are scant and their recourse is slim. When I arrived, it was a ghost town of waist high weeds and abandoned homes whose owners had lost their small bit of equity when either unable to pay a moving fee of up to $10,000 or to find another park that would accept their older homes. Imagining where the displaced people had gone was crushing. Another nearby MHC appeared to be thriving, but warning bells went off when two veterans having a beer outside told me that the park had recently been bought by some guy from California. An employee quietly pulled me aside and confirmed that it was Sam Zell, whose net worth is $5.3 billion and whose company is the largest mobile home park owner in America, owning roughly 140,000 home sites. Most heartbreaking was meeting an elderly woman a few streets down who had resettled there after having to abandon her home in Denver Meadows. She was unaware that the cycle was again repeating itself for her, as it is for countless others whose entire communities are packaged into portfolios and bought by large equity investment firms like Zell's Equity Lifestyle Partners. For residents themselves, the small but growing movement of resident-owned communities is their best chance at stability and survival. Given the importance, vulnerability, and escalating disappearance of mobile homes and mobile home communities, why aren't they being recognized as historically significant or have been included in the National Register? To explore that question is to see the inequality of the historic record, the erasure of some of the most vulnerable from our society. We all have a role to play in making visible this hidden housing crisis and doing something about it. This isn't just history. The ongoing COVID pandemic continues to remind us of how critical and universal the need for housing stability is to our physical and mental health and how interconnected we all are. And so we need to see these places for many reasons to appreciate their unique pasts 
and understand their uncertain futures. The hope is that this understanding is not silent. What we are proposing is a call to action. Regulations and perceptions can change. Edward and I are looking forward to your comments and questions. Thank you.